Hello, everyone. It is time once again for Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we are in the book of Romans, chapter 10. Verse 14 is where we resume our study today. Romans 10, verse 14. The Scripture Verse by Verse website can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com, and you can study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just by clicking on the book you want to study, clicking on the chapter, opening your Bible, following along, and listen, listening as I teach it verse by verse. So you can go through the Bible three times all the way through, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation. That's at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Today, as I said, we're in the book of Romans, chapter 10, picking up our study in verse 14. <clears throat> so let's pray. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And I think we should backtrack a little bit here. And um, let's go back to verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Salvation by faith. How does it work? How are you saved by faith? We have it right here. Verse, uh, verse 9. Here it is. Ready? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. Now, God assumes, and you must understand, that it's not just saying the word. Well, I confess that Jesus is Lord, therefore I'm saved. No, 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 no. God always assumes sincerity. If Jesus truly is your, I mean, it doesn't help for you to lie, right? If Jesus truly is your Lord, if you have repented of your sin, and you have asked him to save you from hell and to be your Lord, to take control of your life, then you can confess him with all honesty as your Lord, and then you're saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It always starts, salvation starts in your heart. It starts by believing the truth of what God says about Jesus being the Savior from hell and the only one who can bring you forgiveness. You have to believe in your heart the word of God concerning Jesus and concerning your need for a Savior and that he's the only one. So it says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession of the fact that Jesus is your Lord is very important. And the bigger principle here is that if you are saved, if Jesus truly is your Lord and your Savior, then you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, it's going to work itself out somehow in your words and your actions. And it will certainly result in you saying, Jesus is my Lord, and you're not going to be ashamed of him. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. You don't get saved by confessing Jesus, but if you don't confess Jesus, you're not saved. Eleven, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. You will never regret trusting in Christ. We are to offer God a sacrifice of righteousness and put our trust in him. Do what is right, even if it goes against the grain of society. Do what is right, even if it's, in, if it's not popular. Obey Jesus because it's right to obey Jesus. And God says right here, if you put your trust in him, you will not be ashamed. You'll never regret it. Never. Oh, you might, you might hit some bumps in the road and you'll get some persecution for trusting Jesus and obeying. But you will never be put to shame. 
as far as you'll never get to the point where you say, you know, I wish I wouldn't have done this. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, and that summarizes all of mankind. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. If you want Jesus to be rich unto you, then you have to call upon him. If you want to be saved through Christ, you've got to call upon him. You have to confess him as Lord because he is your Lord. But it boils down to this. If you don't call upon Jesus, if he's not your Lord and Savior, then forget it. You're not saved. And that's true for every single person in the entire human race, Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. So, there you have it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you're not going to be saved. So those who say, like the preacher I've been talking about in previous couple of verse, a uh, couple of broadcasts, who say that Jews don't have to come to Jesus, let's quit this Christian chatter about telling Jews that they need to, to, uh, to receive Christ. Christian chatter. Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. If you don't. If you don't call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you're not saved. That's not Christian chatter. That's the truth. 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? If Christians do not use every means available to proclaim the word of God, to proclaim salvation through Jesus Christ, then it's not going to be done. Every Christian, every Christian is responsible to help get the message of Christ out to a lost world that is filled with hell-bound sinners. If you have been saved, that is your duty. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Wasn't just told to preachers. It was told to all of his disciples, all of his followers. Not just the apostles. It's not the job of a denomination only. It's not just the job of a preacher. It's not just the job of a missionary. It's not just the job of a pastor. It's the job of every single Christian. Someone says, yeah, but ah, I've never heard of that. There are church buildings all over the place. So if people want to know about Christ, they can go to a church and find out about him. Well, you can say that, but that's not what God says in his word. The Bible says we're to take the message of Jesus to them, not wait for them to come to the church. Many people have heard about Jesus. But many people don't know what the Bible says about salvation through Jesus. The message has to go to them. Many people don't know that it has nothing to do with religion. Many people don't know that it has nothing to do with church. But instead involves repenting of your sin and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what it involves. That's what it's all about. Confessing Jesus as Lord, remember? Because he is your Lord. Because you have repented and you have made him Lord. That's salvation in a nutshell right there. It has nothing to do with church. Church is just some place, hopefully, that you go and you're fed the word of God. And you fellowship with other Christians. But that's not how you get saved. So let's read 14 and 15 together. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him, in, in him and who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I will preach the word of God any way that I possibly can, through any media that I possibly can. And I have been doing it. For over 30 years, I will do it. I will continue to do it. I will look for new ways to do it. 
but I should not have to do it alone. No preacher should have to do it alone. No faithful Bible teacher, and I'm emphasizing faithful, should have to do it alone. God is sending me, and I am going. And I'm using every means that I know of to proclaim the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation without watering any of it down. No, sir, not one single word. And I will go, and I will continue to go. But the Bible says that preachers should be sent. How shall they go unless they are sent? Meaning this, every single Christian who is blessed by the word of God should in some way help the teacher who has blessed them. Every Christian must get involved. Number one, because it is commended by God. Every Christian needs to be involved so that others can be blessed too. We're talking about souls being saved from hell. We're talking about Christians being fed the word of God so that they can live the way Jesus wants them to live and draw closer to Christ. That's what God is talking about here in verse 15. Now think about this. Wouldn't it be unthinkable for a man who finds water in the desert to not share that water with others who are dying of thirst? That would be unthinkable. That would be a horrible thing to do. Well, Christians have found the water of life. Christians have found the message that saves people from hell, the only message that saves people from hell. They have been saved, they have been saved from hell, and it is unthinkable that they would not care about helping others to avoid that horrible, horrible place. Verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report, some first century Jews recognized that Jesus is the Savior, and they repented. But not all, not even most. And nothing has changed today, and it will never change. Most people who hear about Jesus don't care. And most people who hear about Jesus won't be saved. But God still wants them to be told because it is right to tell them. And God does things the right way, regardless of the results. Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh boy, this is such such an important verse. I hope this will correct your thinking if you have a false idea about faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. No one gets saved unless they hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith has to be based on the Bible or it's not faith. If God has not said it, if God has not promised it, then you can't accept it by faith. People throw that word faith around very loosely. Well, I'm doing this by faith. You've got to have faith. Well, I don't know. Do you have a word from God? Do you have a promise from God? Well, no. Well, then what are you talking about? Faith. Well, I have faith that Moret's going to give me a $100 bill. I'm trusting Moret to give me a $100 bill. Well, you just got one minor problem, mister. I ain't promised you a $100 bill. So how can you trust that I'm going to give you that? You can't, trust in, you can't trust in something that has not been promised. And it's the same with us and Jesus. You know, people and, and God and the Word of God. Some People sometimes do all sorts of ridiculous things in the name of faith. And it isn't faith at all. At best, it's presumption. But they do. By faith, I'm gonna by faith, I'm, by faith, I'm gonna buy this car that I can't afford. 
By faith, I'm going to trust that God will give me enough money to make my payments. By faith. Well, there's just one problem with that. God has not promised to give you enough money to pay for that car. You don't have it now, and he has not promised to give it to you in the future. So how can you, by faith, do that? You can't. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God expects us to use our brain. Faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is believing what the Bible says and living it. Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went out into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Talking about Israel. Israel had the Bible. When Jesus started ministering the word of God, he taught the word of God exclusively to the Israelites. When he first sent the apostles out, he sent them exclusively to the Israelites. Go give it to God's people first, his Old Testament people first. They had the word of God. And you know what? Throughout the centuries, many of them understood the word of God. They knew the word of God. But deep down, they didn't believe it. Deep down, they didn't want it. Deep down, they rejected it even though they knew it. And so it didn't do them any good. So many of them believed what they wanted to believe and they rejected what they didn't want to believe. Even when it was all there in black and white, right there on the pages of Scripture, they tried to pick and choose and because of that, they paid. And they continue to pay for their willful rejection of truth today. You can't treat God's word like it's a smorgasbord and think you're going to get away with it. But some people do that today. Some people claim to be Christians. They do. They claim to be Christians. They claim to believe that the Bible is the word of God. And they read something in the Bible and they like it, so they accept it. They read something else in the Bible and they think, you know, if I say I believe that and I start living that, I'm going to lose a lot of friends. I don't believe that. They pick and choose what they want to believe. <clears throat> that doesn't seem right to me, so I'm not going to believe it. <laughs> Who made you the final arbitrator or arbiter of, of the word of God? You yourself did, but it's not going to do any good because it's not true. Verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Israel understood the Bible, but they rejected it. The Son of God was born. The Son of God grew up and taught them the Word of God in person. And they not only rejected the Word of God, they rejected the Son of God too. They had it made. You talk about privilege. The Jews had the Word of God, black and white, right in front of them for all those centuries. They had the Son of God who grew up in their midst and went to their synagogues as an adult and taught them the word of God and claimed to be the Messiah and claimed to be God and gave them the word of God. And they rejected him as well as the word of God. And so all that privilege went down the drain, did do them a bit of good. Then you have the Gentiles who didn't know anything about the Bible. They probably didn't even know there was such a thing as the Bible. But, you know, when the Apostle Paul started giving them the truth, they latched onto it and came to Christ by the droves. God saved many Gentiles. And in the process made some of the Jews jealous. Why? Because after years of being God's people, they were finished. They were finished because they rejected the Son of God and they rejected the Word of God and God doesn't have to put up with that garbage. And he doesn't. They were replaced by those who received Christ. The Jews 
who rejected Jesus were replaced by the Jews and the Gentiles who accepted Christ. God does not have two sets of people today, in spite of what John Hagee says. He does not have two sets of people today. Anyone who tells you that the Jews and the Christians are both his people today is telling you a lie. Anyone who is telling you that, that the Jews don't have to receive Christ to be saved because they have their old covenant with God is telling you a lie. That is completely and totally unbiblical. I, we've seen dozens of scriptures that contradict that foolish statement. God has, he has always had just one people. In the Old Testament, it was the Israelites who had faith in God, like Abraham had. And both Jews and Gentiles could have that faith. Didn't matter what kind of blood you had flowing through your veins. Didn't have to be Hebrew. And, and today, he only has one people as well. Since the crucifixion of Christ, it is those who have repented of their sins, both Jews and Gentiles, Anyone in, from anywhere in the world, it is those who have repented of their sins and asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. They become one of his people. And that's it. There's, there's, no, second, there's no second group. Verse 10, 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found by them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. God, through the word of God and through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, reaches out to sinners who are hell-bound and draws them to Christ. And if he wouldn't do that, they wouldn't come to Christ. If God didn't draw people to himself by the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, they would never seek after him. Notice 20 and 21. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found by them that sought me not. Because that's the only kind of people that there are in the world, the ones that don't seek God. You say, well, I sought God. If you sought, if you sought God and you responded to the word of God and to Jesus Christ, it's only because God drew you to himself. 21. But to Israel he saith, all day long I stretch forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people, the Gentiles, who had no use for God, no thoughts of God, no knowledge of God, when they heard the word of God, sought God and responded to it. The Jews who had it made with all the revelation, all the truth, the vast, vast majority of them rejected it. But you know, God does not give up easy. Always remember that. If you're praying for an unsaved friend or loved one, God does not give up easy. Notice what it says in verse 21. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. All day long. They just kept rejecting. He just kept reaching out to them. He doesn't give up easy. He will extend his offer of mercy to a sinner for as long as he possibly can, right up until the moment of their death. But not beyond that. Then it's too late. But no matter how many times a person willfully rejects Jesus Christ and refuses to repent, God's hand is still extended to them in friendship. Jesus wants them, still wants them. The Father wants them. The Holy Spirit wants them. It's just a dirty, rotten shame that so many people don't want God. And that's, that's the problem. Let's go on to chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. Let's just hold it there for a second. God has not rejected his Old Testament people, Israel nor has he rejected anyone else. People reject God. He doesn't reject them. Oh, he's going to stand his ground, and he's not going to bend to please anyone. He can't. He's God. He's holy. He's just. He's not going to change his way to accommodate some dirty, rotten sinner who doesn't want to repent. It's, it's they who reject God, though. He doesn't reject them. He is the standard. He is God. People have a choice. 
People reject God. He doesn't reject them. They reject God every time they sin. They reject God. They reject God every time they refuse to repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. They reject God when he offers them mercy through Jesus Christ and they say no. They reject God. And so it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. He hasn't cast away the Jews and said, I'm finished with them forever. They can't get saved, none of them. Paul's a living example of that because he's Jewish. And so we see that, again, his people refers to Israelites here in verse 1. God did not reject his Old Testament people. Most of them rejected him. Most of them continue to reject him. Most of them rejected God throughout their entire history, beginning shortly after the Exodus, and they continue to reject him until it all culminated in them rejecting his son. We have no king but Caesar away from him, away, away with him, away with him, crucify him. They rejected God when they rejected his son. Because Jesus himself has said, anyone who doesn't have the Son doesn't have the Father either. You say, Muslims and Jews and Christians, we all worship the same God. We all have a relationship with the same God. It's just that the Jews... And the Muslims reject Christ. I will tell you this. The Jews and the Muslims don't have a relationship with the true God. Because he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. He who has the Son, Jesus said, has the Father also. He who does not have the Son does not have the Father. They're going through the motions, but they're coming up empty. They're trying to get water out of a dry well. And they got a bucket of dust and they'll see it in eternity when they're sent to hell for rejecting the Savior. You reject Jesus. You reject God. Because you've rejected the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's your only hope. Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Know ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah? how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, God chose the Israelites to be his people way, way back. But they rejected him. You go back to the, do a study. Do a study of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. You go back to the very beginning and you will see that throughout their entire history, like history the Israelites had a bad habit of wanting to do things their way instead of God's way. And the rejection of Jesus Christ was in keeping with their continual rebellion against God. And so, the Israelites, along with anyone else who tries to have things their way instead of God's way, will end up defeated. Because believe me, you get in a tug of war with God, you're going to lose. I have to stop, but you can continue studying the Word of God at the Bible, versebyverse.com. Just click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. And remember, please, that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. 30 years this has been a faith ministry. I depend on individuals who love God's Word. So if you want to be a part of this ministry and help support me as I get out the Word of God, you can click on the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and give us as the Lord may lead in a secure method, I made, might add. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com or you can write Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. That's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 434, Port Washington, Wisconsin, 53074. Until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long.